Big Questions with the Dead Milkman. Um, hey, everybody, it's Big Questions with the Dead Milkman. And this week, it's my question. And the question I have for us today is, name an artist that's influential to you that might not be apparent to the listener. So I'm gonna start off and I'm gonna break the rules already. And I'm actually gonna yeah. say that I'm going to choose the entire genre of like country music, um, which might be surprising as an influence for me. Surprising. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, bluegrass uh, country and honky tonk music um, from the 40s, 50s and 60s. Um, I was exposed to at a young age because my uh, my mom's side of the family is from Alabama, and my grandfather, her father, uh, played guitar and banjo, and he played in a bunch of bands, and uh, usually at family gatherings when I was little, at the end of the uh, after dinner or whatever, there was usually some kind of a jam session, because there was usually a couple guitar players, and my grandfather pulled out his banjo, and they played, you know, some bluegrass stuff, and in fact, when I was probably a very early teen, he took me to a bluegrass festival. I wish I could remember who was there, but I'm pretty sure it was a pretty big festival and I've heard some of the greats. Um, but I was just like, you know, blown away by everything. And um, so I was exposed to that kind of music pretty early on. And um, the funny thing is, uh, I'm gonna mention a couple of artists and some songs for us to listen to, or to you, for you to listen to. Um, the funny thing about all these songs is, is that there's not really any drums on these songs. <laughs> the rhythm comes from like the guitar, the, the guitars and the slapping of the upright bass and that kind of thing. So, um, but it's, you know, it's like one, two, one, two, one, two, which is, you know, sort of reminiscent of punk rock music. <laughs> um, so I think that, you know, it's, it, it was definitely a, some kind of an influence on me. Um, so a couple of uh, artists I'll mention, you should check out uh, Lefty Frizzell. And uh, there's a song that uh, you should check out called uh, Shine, Shave, and Shower, It's Saturday. <laughs> um, uh, another one, a, a, a couple of guys named Homer and Jethro, they did a lot of like um, parody songs and uh, popular songs of the time. Um, they have a song called Tennessee Border Number no. Two, which is pretty funny. <laughs> um, they, one of them played guitar and the other one played mandolin. Um, and let's see. Uh, Speedy West, he was a pedal steel player that was pretty amazing. He played on a lot of records out in LA. Um, check out a song called, um, well, actually I have a video from when he appeared on, a, on a, an old country TV show in the early 60s called Country Style. Um, and a more recent artist that I like, I actually went to see him at the North Star Bar, gosh, about 15 years ago now, it's been a pretty long time, is uh, uh, Wayne the Train Hancock, who plays, he does a he does a great, uh, uh, not impression, but he sounds a lot like Hank Williams and he does that style of music. Um, so uh, a couple of songs by him, we'll provide links below. But anyway, so those are, you know, some of my influences, country, bluegrass, honky tonk music. Uh, I think it's probably in my DNA somehow. Um, it doesn't, you know, show up in Milkman songs that much, but I think it's there somehow in my playing and my style. So that's it. I actually knew an Italian family from Alabama, and I just there remember them saying, y'all come back now, except for you, Fredo. Fredo yes, sir. You broke my heart. Yeah. No, this is my, this is my mom's side of the family. Okay. So. Right. The Bynums. Honorary Italian. All right. I, th I think I can, <clears throat> I can hear some of that in the Eat Your Paisley, maybe. Yeah. Like where the tarantula lives is kind of like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... So would those would those have been uh, called a, called hoot nannies? <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe. I mean, it was more of like a casual get together. It was usually family members, or maybe my grandfather. Maybe there would be like a an old old a bandmate of his that would be over for dinner or whatever. I'm just asking because, like, I wonder if people do people still do that? Because I always like fantasize about that when my family gets together, and I'll like sit down at the piano, and people are like, "Can you stop? We're trying to talk," and it's like, oh. So yeah. do people do that? Because I want to be there. <laughs> well, I bet you some people do. Yeah, I know um, people from in Canada, from Cape Breton Island, that, that, that that's what they do. Yeah. When I was in England a couple of years ago, there was a pub down the street and there was a uh, like a 
a band that got together to rehearse on like Tuesdays and they would play somewhere on Fridays and Saturdays. I went to the rehearsal a couple of times and they were awesome. There were like, you know, 15 people of, of the community and then would play some old traditional um, English uh, folk songs and that kind of stuff with singers and everything. And it was just amazing to, to you know, they just hung out and got together and so yeah, that was kind of a hoot nanny. But yeah, <laughs> like, you know, I'm <laughs> We're gonna have to sing a song. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sorry, I'm done. Yeah, where where's you this thing been? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I'll go. I guess I'm next. Um, folks, did you ever wake up with David Bromberg on your mind? And that can only mean one thing. You've got David Bromberg on your mind. Uh, people, do not worry if you don't know who David Bromberg is, because you will in a minute. And you also know a lot of other useless shit, because that's, that's just how I roll. Um, David Bromberg is a musician. He was born here in Philadelphia. He's classified as a folk musician, sometimes a bluegrass or blues musician. Um, now, right now, a lot of people are going, oh, no, a hippie, a hippie. David Bromberg, not a hippie. David Bromberg is a freak, okay? Freaks and hippies are different, all right? The Jefferson Airplane, those were hippies. The Manson family were freaks. <laughs> hippies are like hairy, unkept people who sing about peace and love, and freaks are hairy, unkept people who sing about carnival dancers and murder, okay? Which brings us to the music of David Bromberg. Um, when I was young, I was in my early teens, I was taking music lessons out in Chad's Ford, and a uh, guy gave me music lessons said, you, you ought to check this out. And he played for me a song called Sharon. And we'll put a link up. This is one of the greatest songs. This is David Bromberg's song about a woman dancing in a carnival. And as he says, she came out wearing a scarf and a sneeze. And the carnival talker, not Barker, please don't say carnival Barker, it's carnival talker. The carnival talker says, she walks, she talks, she crawls on her belly like a reptile. And I'm blown away. And then in the song, there's this whole thing about this red-haired bear of a bouncer who says to the crowd, if you want to breathe right, y'all better go. And at the time, the stuff on the radio was like Seasons in the Sun and Muskrat Love. And I am like, holy shit, this is amazing because I I actually, I, I love car. First of all, I'm hooked in by, by any sort of carnival stuff. I think carnies were the first punk rockers. It's a little bit of a digression, but if you want to give a good TED Talk, do a TED talk about the influence of carnies on punk rock. Uh, you know, you've got to, um, oh, you've got like Pinhead, or, uh, the song Pinhead by the Ramones, uh, or you've got um, you've got the movie Multiple Maniacs with John Waters, which has the carnival in it. I'm just saying, carnies were the first, and and, and the song or song Pretty Music. I, I actually have a little circus motif in there. That's how much I love carnies. So I was in. All right, end of digression. Back to the song that really got me hooked on David Bromberg song is called Bullfrog Blues, and it's basically a 16-minute spoken word piece. So David Bromberg was the original Henry Rollins. He's way ahead, way ahead of Henry Rollins, years and years ahead of him. But the, uh, um, the song begins with, with David Bromberg saying, did you ever wake up with bullfrogs on your mind? And that can only mean one thing. You've got bullfrogs on your mind. And he says, it's hard when the woman you love loves your best friend. It's even harder when you and your best friends are roommates. And it's even harder when they move in together. And it goes downhill from there. Um, at one point, he goes to a pawn shop and he walks in and he says, you know, Mr. Pawnbroker, what does it mean, those three balls on your wall? And the pawnbroker goes, that means the odds are two to one against you ever getting your shit out of here at all. So <laughs> and I'm sure there's somebody right now with like a punk rock music podcast going, that's not true. That's not true. The MC5 were the first band ever to say shit. But that just shows like how much David Bromberg has been erased from sort of the history of punk rock. Uh, like like a lot of smart asses, they, they kind of took him out. Um, I say, and, and this is absolutely amazing because all the stuff on the radio was this sort of like sanitized bubble gummy stuff. It's a lot like it is now. Um, but it was, it, this song was kind of an influence on Bitch and Camaro. But somewhere in my head, I think this is the seed of doing a song where somebody just talks and tells a weird story and everything. So I, I would definitely like to thank 
uh, David Romberg for that. Romberg for that. Again, I'd like to thank him for being a smart ass because when people do the history of punk rock, they never talk about the smart ass. It's always like, you know, punk rock began with Iggy Pop. Oh my God, he's smearing peanut butter on himself. That's so crazy. You know, and then there were the Sex Pistols. Then nothing happened. Then we had Nirvana. And now we've got punk pop. Let's go Weezer. And I'm like, I just keep hearing this. I'm thinking like, where are these weird sort of strange acts like David Bromberg when people tell the history of punk? I'm going to bet you there's a lot of punks out there who were influ heavily influenced by David Bromberg. Uh, David Bromberg was such a smart ass that he would play these folk festivals and he would do things like bring a nine piece horn section with him and come out playing this like Detroit funk and go, welcome to Soul City, USA. And the hippies would hate it, but I think the freaks probably loved it. Um, I think if you're booking a punk rock festival, you might, you, you should invite David Bromberg. He keeps playing these god awful, like, you know, festivals that are, you know, he's coming on after, you know, someone's like, a woman lies dying in the gutter. And I, I just feel bad for David. He belongs more in punk rock festivals. So please, if you got a punk rock festival, invite him. The crowd will love him. The crowd will go apeshit for him. He's really, really good. He's, he's the caustic of folk music. It's really <laughs> what he is. <laughs> Have you heard of make caustic acoustic? Uh, Harsh R does the acoustic thing, I know, but but caustic, yeah, that that would kind of be uh, the way David Bromberg probably came across. Uh, for a long time, he was making violins, and he had a violin shop uh, uh, making them and repairing them in Wilmington, uh, and he just sold that uh, this January. But you can go by. I used to always be impressed when I would see his things. I've I've been a fan since my my early teen years. So just want to take a moment to dis to bestow upon David Bromberg official punctum. So David Bromberg, you are now punk. So welcome to being broke and mistreated. <laughs> That's surprising to me. <laughs> <laughs> the artist, the, I, that influenced me that I'm picking that thinking that's probably not obvious I, uh, is a vocal group called the fifth dimension <laughs> they, they, they were very they were probably my favorite group when i was in grade school like the middle of grade school you i, I don't think anybody's not heard of them so i'd probably don't have to explain they had a lot of top 40 hits in the 60 late 60s early 70s almost all their hits were produced by a guy named bones Howe, who Ooh. was part of that whole wrecking crew sound. Um, but that's beside the point. The, um, I had mo most of the albums from, I guess, 69 on through 72, but I, I would look at the, I would obsess over them, uh, study them, look at the labels to the point of knowing who wrote each song I didn't realize some of the songs, I mean, I, I heard like Sunshine of Your Love by Fifth Dimension. I knew that they didn't write their own songs, but I didn't know the, I heard the Fifth Dimension's versions of a lot of songs before I, I got back to hearing the original ones, which is interesting. Like I want to, Sly and the Family Stone song, I want to get you high, higher, I heard by the Fifth Dimension first. <laughs> or Ode to Billy Joe, I heard by them. <laughs> but I wanted, because of this, I wanted to become a songwriter um, and have my name on a, like a Fifth Dimension record or a Partridge Family record or a Three Dog Night record. They're all lumped together in my brain as the same kind of thing. Groups that didn't do their own material. And so in that way, it influenced me. I also learned to play on the piano some of the songs like the Burt Backrack, Hal David ones uh, that Fifth Dimension had hits with. Jimmy Webb, uh, Laura Nairo, and um, so yeah, that was their early influence. On they're probably best known for "Up, Up and Away." In my oh yeah, beautiful, my beautiful, beautiful balloon. Yeah, the, but you ever, have you ever heard "Hot Ride" by the Prodigy, where they take that song and they totally mutate it? No. Never, never heard "Hot Ride." "Hot Ride" has the most disturbing video for it. Uh, I'll. Maybe we'll have to throw that in there. People, the Hot Ride by the Prodigy is one of 
mankind's greatest accomplishments. So, did you see them? I think they played like the Wagon Town Fairs. I don't know if there was. They a did wagon. not play the Wagon Town. I knew Fair. somebody I who actually it. saw them play like a, some sort of local fair or something, and he claimed that there were no <laughs> original members. <laughs> Sixth dimension. Yeah. <laughs> no, did, I'm serious. They played somewhere in our area. Like, yeah, the act was. Well, the I missed them. Engine. Probably at the Valley Forge Music Fair. No, no, I no. Just, because I, I think too I big. saw. This like this was like a state fair. Yeah. This is like you know the spin doctors sucks like the spin doctors at the Iowa State Fair. Yeah, not... <laughs> I saw people perform at the Wagon Town Fair, but not the Fifth Dimension. You you made an interesting point too, Joe, about the covers because a lot of people don't get this, and we, when we were young. It was the song, not who performed it. So you would go to like a record store and you would ask for, you know, like, I, I want to take you higher or whatever. And you would get like maybe the fifth dimension doing it. it it's really weird. It's something that, you know, I, don't I, know know would, it. I think the store people would know better. But no, I know. <laughs> I've known a lot of people that this sort of thing and said when they were young, it was like you went and you got the song. It wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually that's kind of true in the 60s, especially. Yeah. Imagine mm -hmm. people only knowing the Jose Feliciano uh, "Light My Fire" version. I can see that. I like it better than the Doors version. I like anything better than the Doors. God, God, you know. I, I again another digression because I was talking about how screwed up musical history is. But you ever watch like a history of like goth or dark wave, and they'll say, "And it began with the Doors." Like, no, and I shut it off. I'll give it a thumbs down. I'll find out where the guy lives. I'll kill his pets. I don't care. Fuck him. Sorry. Got a angry there. Um, so I, I had chosen one, and then I realized that maybe it's, maybe it's not that unobvious. Maybe it's so. I decided to choose uh, Rutger Gunnarsson, whose name I didn't know until today. He was a <clears throat> he was a bass player for ABBA. <laughs> and as you guys probably know and in, in practice and sound checks and sometimes in the middle of like smoke and banana peels dean and i will do like a disco kind of thing and that octave thing with like the bass like doo -dee -doo -dee, is i swear it was in like because my parents were listening to abba in the 70s i was born in 1978 so i don't know if i just heard a lot of it in the womb but like I feel like that kind of thing calls me like that. And I, uh, I think I squeeze it in every once in a while, but like, um, yeah, maybe that's not that obvious, but I, I like that kind of, um, I looked at, I looked at this guy's life. He's just like always in ABBA, just <laughs> always there. And then he died. Um, <laughs> he didn't play with any other groups. He, it, it said he played with Adam Ant at some point. Yeah. yeah. Fuck yeah. Respect. I couldn't, I couldn't find out which album. Um, but you know, the, uh, the other option I was thinking was Charles Mingus. Um, but not that I sound anything like him, but he was, I was, he, I always thought he was kind of like the punk of jazz. <laughs> like he was in the way. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, there's a great movie I watched in film school, uh, called Mingus. And it's, it's basically him getting like evicted from his apartment in New York. I think it's from like 1968 or something. And He's got his daughter there and he like he's talking about his life and stuff and he pulls out like a shotgun or something or a rifle <laughs> um but yeah and i think he's he's like he's like chinese german african-american um and he's a badass bass player he was like a band leader um so yeah was it was it mingus who taught his cat to use the toilet <laughs> I, I thought know. that was Jaco Pistorius. Jaco no, Pistorius no. did a lot of weird shit. I, I'm pretty sure it was. Mingus might have taught his cat I'll, to use I'll, the toilet. I'll, yeah. I'll verify that and, and let you know. Fat Freddy's cat from the Freak Brothers. They taught it to use the toilet at one point. <laughs> um, Dan, I have a question. <laughs> yeah, I have a question, Dan. Yeah. Abba is Abigail, Anya, Anya, Bjorn, and Benny. Not Abigail, Anya, Bjorn, Benny, and Rucker. It's not Abbar. I'm saying. <laughs> Something suspicious going on here. Well, you know, what you don't know is that they all slept with him, too. So oh, okay. <laughs> they, just, they didn't want to put the R in there because everybody was fighting over it. He well, died I, in a I, Volvo choking on a Swedish it, meatball. Well, I, I confess my ignorance. I mean, 
did, did the four visual representations of ABBA, did they actually play any instruments on the album? Yeah, Bjorn and Ben yeah. are actually the very guys, good keyboard players right now. Yeah. Yeah, they they um played keyboard and I think guitar. And they wrote all the songs, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Um I just I don't know. I've probably talked about it before that I love ABBA, but um yeah, there's just like it's not even always that that like octave thing. There's like a, a tone to the the bass in those songs. Like that song SOS. Um I don't know. Good. The most one of the most bizarre surrealistic events that I've ever been to was going when we played in Austria years ago. Mm -hmm. We had a night off, and the promoter took us to a rock club in Vienna. And the band performing that night was called Bjorn Again. They mm -hmm. they were Australia's yeah. most popular ABBA cover band. The place was packed with like five or six hundred drunk. Mm -hmm. They were incredible. Yeah, it was it was absolutely amazing. I mean, they were tight, and they were. It was an awesome show. So yeah, yeah, we had a lot of fun that night. There used to be a band out of Australia called um, Abba Abba Hey, and they did Abba songs in the style of the Ramones. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think there's something really like um, like driving about that like bass and drum thing. Like, what's that band uh, Emerald Sapphire and that song roller coaster or oh, whatever like no, that. that's ohio players roller coaster of love no, 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 no. i'm thinking of a different song oh. um uh your love makes me feel like roller coaster uh, i'll put a link to it okay you know about the strange conception of the dark-haired woman in alba right i don't have to go into that story do i is this like the older cunningham child no, 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 no. They, there's, there's, there's a blonde young lady. I can't remember which is which. Who's Anya and who's Frida or whatever. Uh, but one of them has dark hair. She was actually part of the. Uh, I'm not joking about this. The Nazis had a sort of breeding program where women would 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 have sex with SS men in order to breed blonde haired, blue eyed children. And what came out of this experiment was the one dark haired, dark eyed person in ABBA. So yeah, that's another win for the Nazis. They really knew what they were doing. But that's absolutely true. She was part of Lebensburn, which was the uh, the, the program to to give birth to uh, um to pure air. But what they wound up with was ABBA. So like the boys from Brazil. No, not that's cloning. No, for real. This is a real. I'm not joking. You can you can look this up. Uh, it's uh, I'm sure she's a nice person. She's not a Nazi. You no, know, but she that's what her her parentage was um, again um, it's, it's a little bit of weirdness i happen to know because at this point i just know everything <laughs> <laughs> oh well that's interesting dan i didn't i wouldn't yeah. have never considered abba yeah yeah all right let's move on to recommendations shall we um i would like to recommend a video which you can watch on youtube um, it is called, What Happens If the Moon Crashes into Earth? It's about 10 or 12 minutes long. It's animated. It's very entertaining. Um, and I think it surfaced uh, on some of the sites that, or, you know, I saw it on one of the sites that I check out, uh, you know, every day or at least once a week. Um, because there's a new movie out uh, called Moonfall which I'll provide a link to the trailer. It looks like Moonfall is a sci-fi movie. It looks like it's played for some laughs. I don't know. It doesn't look very good, to be honest with you, but um, the, the actual science uh, movie, what happens if the moon crashed into the earth is very, very interesting. I never even thought of that before. Um, it's very unlikely for that to happen, so don't worry about that. But if it did, it would be pretty pretty darn horrible. So check it out. The moon used to be part of the Earth, and then there was an asteroid collision that actually broke off, and that's where we get the moon from, just so you know. So Rodney knows. If, 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 the, if the moon comes towards the Earth, I would start playing Reunited, and it feels <laughs> so good. <laughs> what, would the, what would the ocean do if the moon wasn't? So, of course, um, well, the, the video takes you through, uh, like, it, it assumes that it will take one year for this to happen for, for before it to crash into the Earth. And it tells you like every month, every couple of months, what happens. Of course, the tides would get all crazy pretty early on. And so you would have super high, t high tides and then you would have super low tides and you would start to see, uh, you know, the receding water. You would see uh, 
land that you would never see before. And it would just get worse and worse from there. And because of the gravitational pull getting stronger and stronger between the earth and the moon, you'd have all kinds of volcanoes, you'd have earthquakes. Um, it would just get really, really bad in, in a short amount of time. So tide goes in, tide goes out. We can't explain that. Remember that quote from Bill O'Reilly? Uh, <laughs> Now, a lot of uh, I hope there's a, I saw a, doc, a long documentary. It was almost like a series once about what would happen if the moon went away from the Earth. And it turns out that Martin Landau would be in charge. Of the <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> oh, love that Martin Landau. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a great show. Um, what? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say my first recommendation. You guys remember the great courses? You said thing for the great courses. It's now called Wonderum, and, and it really should. If you get a chance, subscribe to it. It's awesome. But I'm recommending people subscribe to it so they can see a course called A History of England from the Tudors to the Stuarts. Uh, it's taught by a professor. I'm going to butcher his name. It's Robert. I think it's Burchols, which is B-U-C-H-O-L-S. And this guy just loves history. I think I, I'm a big history person, and I think a lot of people aren't into history because it was approached kind of dry. And, and this guy's just, he's basically up there telling from Edward III, he goes way down really into the uh, Hanoveran dynasty sort of, but he uh, um, he's having a hell of a time. He's uh, he's cracking up over the names of Lambert Simnel and Perkin Warbeck. And I know at some point, some billionaire is gonna name his children Lambert Simnel and Perkin Warbeck. He's <laughs> cracking up over that. He's fighting back the temptation to call Cardinal Wolsey a dickhead. You can just see him, he's like, Cardinal Wolsey, <laughs> the most hated man in English history. And my wife's like, Cardinal Wolsey's a dickhead. I'm like, I, I concur. Um, it's really, really good. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, what good does knowing a lot of history do me? Uh, you know, because I know a lot of history and I, you know, I play keyboards in a punk band. But uh, um, let's say somebody were to come through that door over there right now with a machete and say, I will kill you if you cannot name the uh, three of Henry the Seventh's children who survived him, I'd be alive. He couldn't. I, I, I can name them. You know, it, it was it was Meg, Mary, and 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 Henry who would become Henry the Eighth. I would live. So there you go, people. That's why you need to learn history. <laughs> uh, so the next up on my list, um, Vienna and I watched a horror movie on Saturday night, as we always do, uh, called Come True, which uh, from twenty twenty one, which I'm not going to recommend uh, because it was a really good movie up until the ending. And people go, how bad was the ending? And I say, well, you know, the U.S. release of The Descent, the ending they put, it was that bad. So um, I, I don't recommend the movie. But during the movie, on the soundtrack was Coelacanth by Shriekback, which is one of my favorite songs. And I'm like, how fucking timeless is this song that, you know, it was on the soundtrack of Manhunter, you know, the first Hannibal Lecter film in the 80s. And now it's it's 2021 and they're using it on a soundtrack. So people will put a link. If you've never heard Coelacanth by Shriekback, go listen to it. You will love it. It's absolutely amazing. It, again, it's almost like Dead Can Dance meets The Damned. I mean, it's really, really super good. Uh, and then um, the last thing I want to talk about is um, studies have shown that most people would never, would rather never hear again. They'd rather go completely deaf for the rest of their lives than to hear the music of the Black Keys, the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs, or Beach House. And yet, Corporate radio insists that you like these bands and, and you know you don't. And that's why I have a radio show uh, and the newest episode of it is out there. I play everything from Analog Blood to the Yardbirds. Uh, it's kind of in the style of college radio. Remember, you'd listen to college radio to hear the stuff you couldn't hear on corporate radio. Well, that's what I do. I play it. I'll put up the link. Uh, it's two hours worth of music. So that works out to about 25 songs. So, so please give it a listen. All right. And now I've got to go back to laughing at the name Perkin Warbeck. I'd like to recommend a book called Entangled Life. It's a nonfiction book by Merlin Sheldrake, who is a biologist and writer. <laughs> and it's about mushrooms or fungi. Um, it's it, 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 Mr. Sheldrake um, explains pretty much the latest research, including research he's done on his own. Uh, into mush into mushrooms and mycelium, and how really, what? In, the importance of these th things. Hmm? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Mycelium. My what? <laughs> Nothing. So you're saying a man named Merlin Sheldrake 
wrote a book about mushrooms. <laughs> uh, and it's really good. It's fascinating. I read it. It it's even I can understand the way he explains things. If he doesn't, if he doesn't turn up buck naked at the Rem Fair humping a rock, I'm going to be really disappointed. <laughs> Maybe we'll show a picture of him. <laughs> yeah, can we see Mr. The Shedrake? Back. There he is right there. There's part and, of his... Uh, Wait, put that closer. Wait, I want to see Mr. Sheldrake. Can I put that closer to the camera, please? It's Richard the Third. There he is. Is he wearing an, is he have an ascot? I think he's got a ruff. I think he's wearing a ruff. <laughs> is he wearing I think a ruff? He's from the United Kingdom or something? Yeah, well, we figured that out. <laughs> anyway, that's beside the point. Yeah, <laughs> we're running out of time. I would also, secondary recommendation, they're not as strong as this, but related, is a documentary called Fantastic Fungi from 2019. You can watch it on Netflix. Despite the overbearing musical soundtrack, I still think it's worth a look for the time-lapse photography, which is very beautiful, of all kinds of mushrooms sprouting up here and there. And you get to meet some of the people characters, some of the mushrooms that are mentioned here, but also some of the scientists that are mentioned in this book. You, they can talk in their Paul statements for, for one. That's it. Cool. Um, I'm just going to recommend... Uh... The, there's a, a Mingus live album, Live at the Bohemia, 1950, 1955. Um, it's good. I think Mingus is a good, needs. it's a good like bridge for people that like rock or like punk to get into jazz. Because I'm not a huge jazz fan, but it's cool. He does some interesting stuff. He was the smartest um, one in his family. He was the cunning Mingus. <laughs> <laughs> Sponsor, please. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.